This is the Gauntlet Podcast. My name is Jason. This is a special episode of the podcast. We are going to be talking about the results of the recently held writing contest for the Between role-playing game. I am joined by the judges of that contest and the normal hosts of the Gauntlet podcast, Jemmy. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Jason. <laughs> yes, so thank, thank, thank you for this for, opportunity. Thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. And of course, Lowell. This was a lot of reading. It was a huge <laughs> amount of reading, yes. Wow. yes. Thank you for being judges. The response was great. <laughs> it was. It was great. I was <laughs> stunned. Really when I saw the volume of the the entries, it was great. Yeah, it was really something. So let me tell the listeners what The Between is and kind of what the contest is. So The Between, in case you don't know, which if you're listening to this, you probably do know, but in case you don't, it is a role-playing game about monster hunters in Victorian era London. It's powered by the apocalypse, but it's also based off of uh, my game, Brindlewood Bay. And It is a very dark and sensual and a little campy, but mostly dark and sensual mystery horror game. It's inspired by Penny Dreadful, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, things like that. The way the game works is structurally you have these scenarios that are called threats. And the threats can be serial killers or monsters, vampires, that kind of thing. And uh, you sort of like are trying to stop these threats, right? It's the structure of the game or these, these threats. And so what we did for this contest is we asked participants to write a threat for the game. And as Lowell mentioned, we got an incredible response. We got 45 submissions, which was way more than I thought, <laughs> with apologies to the judges, because I, I pegged it at about like 35 <laughs> or 25. I was like, I think we'll be lucky to get 25. But no, it was really, really, really great response. We'll talk a little bit about just the contest generally, and then... You all, as the judges, have made spotlight picks, and so we'll talk about the judges' spotlight picks, and then I have made some spotlight picks of my own as the creator of The Between. I didn't mention that earlier, but I I wrote the game. I'll do my creator spotlight picks, and then we'll do the top five in the contest. Um, You all have ranked first through fifth place, and we will start with fifth place and work through. Let's just kind of get going. Judges, general thoughts about the contest, about the entries, about the quality of the entries, anything else that stuck out to you? By the time I got done reading with all 45 of them, I had a really strong sense of what constituted good moments, Mm -hmm. good paint-the-scene prompts, good threat setups, good NPCs. You saw all different kinds of qualities and approaches to those things. And yeah, just reading them, I had a better sense of how these ought to be, could Mm -hmm. be, at their most brilliant, because I was seeing brilliance of some kind in almost all of them. I was surprised by how much I learned about my own game <laughs> in reading the threats. Uh, there, were, there were aspects of my game that I don't think I really picked up on, even when I was writing it and having run it a million times. People were doing things with the threats that were really outside the box and really told me something about my games. My spotlight picks involve that a little bit, so I'll talk about that more later. But Jamie, what do you think about just generally the contest? How'd it go? I'm surprised that you were surprised at how many entries came in, (laughs) mostly because I feel like the between has really captured people's imaginations, right? So I managed to get into three different games of the between. Each was at least four sessions long. The between is just so much fun to play. It's such an evocative playground that you've built with the game, with the playbooks. I can see how lots of writers, game designers would just love to jump at the chance to create a threat for the between. And you could really see that in the entries, right? You could see how excited people were to take part and do their own spin on things. So it was really, really cool seeing that. Yeah, that's awesome. And well, thank you for your kind words as well about the game. I'm, I'm, I've been really pleased with the response to the game. And, oh God, I'm not going to cry. I, <laughs> I love being in communication with people, like with players and with other GMs. And it's really felt like through this game, I've been like in really strong communication with players and GMs. And I just love that. Like, it just feels so good. Lowell, what are your thoughts about the contest? Well, one is the quality was so high. Like, it was very hard choosing because, I mean, I went through the 45 and by that time I had maybe cut it down to half. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go through again. and, And again, it was... It was very strong quality across the board. The other thing was it was a pleasure to kind of read these for me 
coming at it as a GM is when I was reading, I was going, what is this giving me as a toolbox? How would I bring this to the table? And so many of the threats laid out the stuff in a way that when I read it, I immediately went, yeah, I'd see how I would do this. I'd see how this would feel at the table. I see why this works this way. And that was really striking. I could tell as I was reading them, I got a really good sense of who of the participants had either played or GM'd the game a lot. Mm -hmm. That came through in the writing. And without even knowing who wrote them, because I was reading them more or less blind like you all were, although I received the initial submissions, I forgot who wrote what. But I was more or less reading them blind. And I went back and looked at some of them and I was like, oh, well, of course that person, you know, I had that response to it or I had that response because I know that person has run the game a lot. Right. And so that was really interesting. That said, I don't think that was like a requirement for doing well in the contest necessarily, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it definitely came through. Right. Because the game is a bit of a clockwork in the way that the different parts of it work. Right. Like it's all like very meant to all work a certain way. And so. I do think that the people who had actually like played the game a little bit had maybe just a tiny, tiny leg up on uh, on others. But but nevertheless, the structure I think I made the scenario structure be so that anyone can get in there and write, right? Anyone can get in there and write cool stuff and make cool stuff mm-hmm. for it, right? And they'll be they'll be pretty well supported. Well, that's awesome. Why don't we go ahead and just go right into the spotlight picks? So we should say here that the spotlight picks were not the winners. <laughs> so if you hear your spotlight pick, I'm sorry, you did not win. But we loved your entry enough that we wanted to highlight it in some way and talk about it a little bit. Sherry, which was your spotlight pick? I went with black and white and red all over. Because for me, it was the one that I read and I went, oh, this has the whole package. It was very Victorian in the sense that it was about the newspapers and stories in the newspapers and corrupt policemen who were just going for an easy solution. And then it was also kind of bat nuts. It was uh, because essentially the threat is an angel and the victims are these supernatural creatures that were handled very well, djinn. And they were like the kind of djinn that I adore, which is sort of trickster characters that are very real and very full of love of life and passion. And so it was just this beautiful set of things that I loved. I loved like the corruption and bigotry and entitlement that you get a big face full of right to start. I loved that the antagonist is a horrible, supernatural angel, just a standard Western angel. It was just awful. So, you know, you have these things of, well, that's probably what it is anyway. I mean, the players will determine what's going on. It just had it all. And I loved it from first read. And I kept trying to tell them it was the best, but they had all these other opinions. So, <laughs> but I should, loved it. A lot it. of good. I know right? that yeah. was. And that was, it was the one that caught my heart first. That was really fun. I thought that one was fun because it played with the Sweeney Todd idea a little bit, right? Like it had like nods to Sweeney Todd, which I thought were it, really, really exactly. fun. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it had great moments in it, too. Mm. Like, ones that I go, oh, yeah, I wanted to... those were just perfect for those little interlude scenes. So, yeah. just really good stuff. We should mention that Black and White and Red All Over was by David Morrison, who you all oh. may know. Oh, David! <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. The judges are learning the authors, like, in real time, y'all, so... Yeah. <laughs> David, I liked yours best, so... Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sherry fought the good fight for Red, Black, and White, Red, All Over. She did. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Lowell and Jamie, do you have anything else to say about that one? No, it, was, it was good. We did our lists of tops and, and we kind of looked at what were overlaps. And then there was a lot of discussion about that. And that one was whoa, was good. Yeah, it was, it was solid. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. yeah. Yeah, this is just a reminder of how hard it was to pick. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Lowell, what was your judge's spotlight pick? My pick was the Kensington Killer. And this is a very conventional threat. This is an Agatha Christie or a Knives Out scenario in which there is a murder of some kind in a classic British family with some twists to it and a nice presentation of characters. It's got a great setup, good, solid, basic stuff. It leans into here are the NPCs because that's who you're going to be working with primarily. The other things matter, but the NPCs are really strong and involved the initial setup questions felt strong they added something and told us about where we were going it was a good classic one it'd be the kind of one that would be fun to do maybe after you've done a lot of supernatural or 
if you wanted to kind of transition from more mundane to get weirder as you went along. Like, I think it, it hits a tone that a lot of the other ones are very wild, striking, mythic elements. This one goes, okay, the threat can be a little more grounded. And I really like that. What I like about that one a lot, it really, really enriches the setting of The Between because Mm -hmm. it introduces these characters who have a connection to Hargrave House. And in my little Twitter review thread that I did of the entries, I noted that you would probably want to play this one a little contradictory to what you said, Lowell, but like you'd probably want to play it either really early or really late Mm -hmm. because it it establishes things about Hargrave House that even the core rules don't entertain. Yeah. But it's really, really fun. I got Succession vibes from it. I don't know if anyone Mm -hmm. watches Succession here, but it really has like strong Succession vibes as well, I thought. It was such a great cast. I can see how seeing these like hunters, quite a few who are quite monstrous themselves to interact with these people i could see like how that could go into like so many cool directions i really appreciate a really good solid social aspect that's built into a threat Mm -hmm. yeah it's very like devilish fun kind of threat right (laughs) nasty people saying and doing nasty things to each other yeah it's just fun yeah Yeah. exactly and the stakes for hargrave house are pretty significant Mm -hmm. so it does have one that has like a lot of uh, pressure on it for the players to get this right because if they don't figure out what's going on they stand to lose their funding (laughs) right like yeah which is like a big problem so yeah that's Mm -hmm. great love that one great great pick so, Jamie, what was your judge's spotlight pick? Oh, wait, you have oh. to tell us before you move on. You tell us who oh, wrote yeah. that. Oh, um, yeah, that was by Shane. Oh, oh yeah. yes. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Yeah, I suspect that one's going to turn up in play pretty soon <laughs> for, mm-hmm. for some group. So, yeah. Okay, Jamie, what was your judge's spotlight pick? Anybody who's played with me knows I love body horror. Mm-hmm. So I had to pick The Grinder mm-hmm. as my spotlight. I loved it so much the whole time i was reading it i was going ooh, mm, mm, so good like such good <laughs> body horror and i especially love it because it's tied to some really good themes it's really tied to the idea of classism how capitalism objectifies all of us how the elite feel they can rework us and build us to be better and stronger and i liked how that connected really strongly there are some really harrowing descriptions and moments in the locations that i really really loved and i'm going to definitely bring in this threat i may have also been slightly biased because i played the mother well one of the characters i played was the mother and i really really got to enjoy that character and i couldn't help but feel like oh if you have a mother in play this is such a good mystery to have because there's this like instant binary opposition between the two of you right like Mm -hmm. i can see that playing out so beautifully like how would the mother feel about the grinder yeah we should mention that the grinder is about this essentially this villain called the engineer i believe they're called in the in the Mm -hmm. threat and Mm -hmm. what they're doing is they are uh, it's kind of like a Doctor Who Cyberman thing. Like they are mm-hmm. capturing people and making like a new superior mechanical Britain, right? Like it's a... <laughs> but I see what you're saying there, though. Like this idea of like a character that's very in opposition to the mother. That actually reminds me of something that I thought of when I was reading that one, which is not a knock on the thread at all. It's a compliment, if anything. But I actually think that the grinder or the engineer, at least, this character, would make a great mastermind. Yeah, that too. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. like, in the game, the campaign structure is the mastermind. They're, like, the big, big bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just thought mastermind, because a lot of times the threats tend to be, like, more, like, street-level kind of dangers, Mm -hmm. you know? This danger is, like, trying to transform Britain, (laughs) right? Like, they're trying to, like, make new people. (laughs) And I even wonder if, like, in the context of a threat, if you would even get to see the full machinations of their evil. But I remember having that thought, though, like it would be a great mastermind. That's such a good point. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. I'd love to upgrade that to mastermind level. That's so true. And that was an adventure that the questions like really made you go, ooh, when you saw the questions, you know, Mm -hmm. for answering. Exactly. Yeah, because the question is, when the engineer fuses flesh and metal, are they more interested in creating the perfect machine or the perfect man? Oh, so good. It's good. Excellent, excellent. I also like the simple question that you posed at the start. The engineer has eluded Hargrave House once before. Mm. What happened? What a great question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a question that opens up so many really interesting stories and connections and things and and does a lot of Mm -hmm. world building in itself. World building baked right into the very beginning. Yeah. Also, 
kind of makes me think like they should be a mastermind. <laughs> right. like, I think I, yeah. like they the really more I think like about it, the more I agree. Yeah. True, yeah. True, true, yeah. true, true, true. But it was, it was great. I agree. It was very well written. The body horror was very on point. It, it had a very HG Wells vibe. It was, it was terrific. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was really, really mm-hmm. awesome. Before we move on, let me say who wrote the grinder. Okay. Sadly, this is the only one of our picks tonight that I was not able to get their actual name. I only got like the nickname that it was sent under, Ooh. which was Dr. Lucky. <laughs> so. <laughs> Sounds like another mastermind. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, and the problem is like the, the email probably had the proper name, but like there was no way to search for it. And so I just like I messed myself up by not getting the name in the beginning. Whereas all the rest of them, the file, you could do like a search and their name would pop up on the uh, mm. on the Google Drive search. So I just got mm. Dr. Lucky. I'm so sorry for the author of that one that we're not going to say your name on the program, but you wrote a badass threat. We love it. You did. Mm-hmm. You did. Okay. Let's go to creator spotlight. So I have a few spotlight picks that I want to highlight really quickly the first is the shoreditch slugger by sarah bowling and the shoreditch slugger is about this underground boxing match that takes place though the threat is really simple there's just a boxer who is really really good and it's because they're <laughs> supernaturally strong there's a big strong person what i love about this though it's, it's very well written but apart from that what i think is so great about it is when i said earlier like I learned something about my game. One of the things I learned about my game from this contest is that not every threat has to be a bloody Grand Guignol horror show, right? Mm-hmm. Like they could, they can be different scales and stakes and, and, and scope of things. And this is one of those instances where there's really nothing at stake. The main thing that's at stake is that the mastermind might hire them as like muscle, <laughs> you know, or something if they don't like figure out what's going on. But it's otherwise a pretty low stakes thing. And another thing I love about this one is I like it when the threats take a cultural thing about the era and recontextualize it to be a supernatural threat. I think that's really fun. And that's kind of what is happening here as well, because these kinds of boxing matches were very popular with this allegedly genteel set. I really love that one. Do you all remember that one? Did you have a chance to? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a smart one. Yeah, it was, it was fun. And that's a good point, right? About taking something from the past and, and giving it that little supernatural edge. It just sort of like repaints all of history for you in a really fun way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was loads of fun. My other spotlight pick is The Miasma of Misswell Hill. <laughs> I love that one too. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I just had to jump on to that I, one, yeah. I saw everyone's top list and I feel like that one just missed out in the winner's circle right it was so close so close yeah yeah. it was a good one that one's by chloe germain and james smith and what is this one is essentially about there is this deadly miasma that is like affecting people and it's originating from a rookery which is a slum in victorian london what's really lovely about this threat is it's very well researched it is so beautifully researched every piece of it feels authentic like it just feels so authentic like the characters the descriptions of things the language that the characters use like it's all really really well researched and uh, and beautifully presented i didn't know it when i was reading it but i went back and looked and when i saw that chloe and james wrote it it all made sense because they both work on an academic journal dealing with gothic horror <laughs> so, wow, cool. so that knowledge was really coming through in the um that sort of historical knowledge was coming through really strongly in the threat it's beautifully written i want to do something with this one i just i really really loved it and my other spotlight pick is the reaver's last victim and this is by Alyssa han now this one requires a little bit of setup because mm-hmm. in the core game there is an instance where you can learn about a former resident of Hargrave House called Roger the Reaver. And Roger the Reaver is a serial killer who used to work at Hargrave House, but was also a serial killer, keeping with the game's themes of the protagonists are kind of the bad guys, right? And sometimes. And, <laughs> and so you don't learn much about Roger the Reaver. You just know that Roger liked the conservatory part of the house, and you know, that was what he, you know, he was into. But what's great about the Reaver's last victim is it's presented as a side threat. Like it's not a full threat. So it's already introducing like an interesting new concept in the game. And there's no real danger going on. All it is, is they never found Roger the Reaver's last victim. And Hargrave House feels like a responsibility because Roger the Reaver was a part of Hargrave House. And so the stakes as they were, are just whether the last 
family member of that victim will like die without that resolution, right? Without being, without that situation being brought to an end. Just when I read it, it just hit me emotionally. Like it was just, a, mm-hmm. it just walloped me. I mean, this is so good. And there's something about just taking the game into that really intense emotional space where the only thing that's at stake is emotion. Yeah. It's pretty terrific. And uh, it was really special to me. It was probably like, I wasn't a judge, but if I had been a judge, it would have been way, way up there on the list for me. It was one of those where you could see the scene, like if this was a TV show of yes. like where mm-hmm. they set it up where the guy comes and leaves some flowers on the steps and that sort of thing. And you see them and then it's revealed who they are and why everyone's acting a little squirrely around them. And you get that little backstory mm-hmm. and it's just that little thread that goes through a season and you hope gets resolved. It is. It's lovely and poignant it just really hit home in a big way. And again, like the Kensington Killer, it, it really expanded the setting a lot. Like it really took the setting, the established setting, and really like blew it up, which I think is uh, very gratifying and awesome. Okay. Now we get to first through fifth place. We're going to start with fifth place. These are the top five picks from our judges, listeners. I'm excited. Let's Let's begin. Okay. Just take turns here. Sherry, who was our fifth place pick what was the entry it was called deadly art deadly art yes and the first thing that struck me as i read it is there were so many fabulous characters in it that i love to hate mm-hmm. and i knew i would want to play this at the table so i would be like let them go oh, okay we'll try to save their life <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> they were all awful all awful so i'm uh, just really good stuff what was it let's do a little recap of it what was what's the setup of that one what's kind of happening in deadly art if i remember correctly it's dead body found and lots of artwork around right Right. yeah there's a club a social club that is a set of artists or people who do art and it's a secret society of some sort and they seem to get really popular and then maybe that stops happening and mm-hmm. there's some tragedy so mm. that is kind of what's going on and as it unravels it turns out that there's a nefarious character that's uh, in the middle of them, and that's who the investigators end up having to deal with. And I know Lul and Jamie had some strong thoughts on this one. I really loved how there's so much malicious pettiness yes. on display, <laughs> yes. and I feel that's so important. Like I think it draws upon like the art world and secret societies, right? So, for example, this really made me laugh out loud when I was when I was reading it. The exhibition is called Death As It Is, and a very detailed canvas called Sudden Death of a Gallery Owner. Seems fine, right? right but then yeah. later it's the desired death of an artist, the shocking death of an actress, the ridiculous death of a ph- philanthropist. It just goes <laughs> on. And my favorite was the deserved death of a critic, right? So, <laughs> so, so I just really, really love that. Like, I feel like it brings so much personality to the threat. As a keeper, there'd be so much fun pettiness to play with there. For me, there's a lot of great like classic supernatural tropes that this is leaned into. Obviously, the portrait of Dorian Gray, you know, is another kind of horror painting. But also, you know, I grew up with Night Gallery being shown in reruns with the sort of horrible paintings, and that stuck with me. And there are several British horror anthology movies that have paintings as an element. There's one with Tom Baker as this mad artist. And it all reminds me of that it draws on some great classic tropes and the art world and art gallery is a great location for the gm to just spin out and talk about things and set the scene and let people paint the scene about okay what's the picture you see here what's on display it's a really evocative setting and the threat does a good job to integrate that and make it really interesting yeah for me what stood out was it was the characters. It was the pettiness. It was the art world. It was, I love to play characters that have this can't be vampy, wicked quality. It's just a kind of character I love to play. And like, this is just stuffed to the gills with them. And um, just great, great fun. And dealing with some great themes too, I thought. Like mm-hmm. just, you know, it's really, really, really fun stuff. I should mention that this entry is by Andre. A fun fact about this entry it was written in Russian, oh, and then wow. uh, Andre got got people to translate it to English. So amazing! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't have guessed that the writing is so strong. I wouldn't it's have guessed really any great. kind of ESL or translation yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They did a great job. It's awesome. It's a terrific. But thank you so much, judges, and congratulations to Andre. Let's go to the fourth place entry, Jamie. What was the fourth place entry? 
Right. So the fourth place one is Calico Jenny's Curious Clouder. Ah, uh, say that five was... times fast. <laughs> I know, I know. I was already like, okay, okay. I had to concentrate just to get that out. It's a really interesting threat. I just love the idea of it so much. But basically, there was a spinster mm-hmm. found dead in a posh town house. I love the description. Her skin pulled taut, her mouth stretching in a rictus grin. <laughs> and what goes missing is all of her prize-winning felines. <gasps> Gasp. <laughs> right. And so what I really love about this is that the question is so interesting because you have to figure out, does Jenny control the clouder or does the clouder control Jenny? And for those right. who don't know, a clouder is a group of cats. I just love the question. It reminds me of the threat about the vampire, right? Like how it changes the context entirely. Like if it's a vampire who's a child right, or, yeah. or just an old vampire that was turned long ago. So I feel like this is the same thing. Because the idea of sinister cats or this woman who's controlling the cats in a sinister way. Excellent. Just really, really good. Well, and what's great about the way it presents those questions and opportunities is the rest of the text supports both options really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. The stronger mm-hmm. entries did this. Like, the stronger entries accounted for all the possibilities in mm-hmm. of the questions and opportunities, like, sufficiently in the rest of the portion of the, of the threat. And mm-hmm. this one did a great job of it. So no matter which way the group came down on in terms of the question, the text was backing you up. The text had stuff mm-hmm. to back you up, right? There, mm-hmm. there were yeah. things to help mm-hmm. you out with. Calico Jenny's Curious Clouder. Sherry, other thoughts? I loved it because poor Jenny was like the housemaid that had taken care of the cat. So she was already long suffering or she was already behind the whole plot to off the widow. I don't know which, but um, you would decide. However, it was I loved it because it was a super clever thing that seemed much lighter in a lot of ways. And the whole idea is that supernatural is like often, as you said, grand gunal or horrible or like sweeping a big. This is almost cottage witch level mm-hmm. of supernatural. That's kind of fun to, to trip over and go. It's going to be a bit before anyone dies, but bad things are ha- going to happen if you don't handle it. It's just I think that it's a good palate cleanser after something heavy is how it feels to me. Or, you know, essentially, so you're switching the tone between episodes or mysteries. And I just, I really liked it because it was very strong written. Every bit of it was just right what you needed to move along quickly. Did you all catch the the Calvin and Hobbes reference in it? No. A, one of the moments is a street urchin, a foul-mouthed street urchin with his bedraggled tiger, stuffed tiger head. <laughs> yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's yeah, awesome. It's fun. Well, what'd you think of Calico Jenny? So the one thing I have to say ahead of time is I kind of had a hard time with this one because we had a cat die uh, in the middle of mm-hmm. the starting to read these things. And when I got to this, it really threw me off. But going back and rereading it, the one thing that really got me is how funny and smart the side characters mm-hmm. are. It's hilarious. The side yeah. characters are charming and fit the tone there's a breed of 1960s, 1970s British horror movie, like Fibes and things like that, yes. that has a little bit mm-hmm. of tongue in cheek. Yeah. This captures that feeling so well. Mm-hmm. The, the side characters really do a great job of bringing things up and are dynamite. Yeah, I agree completely. Who wrote it? Who yeah. wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that there was another cat-focused threat called mm-hmm. The Lords and Ladies of Weymouth House, also quite good. I want to give a shout-out to mm-hmm. the, right. other, the other cat true, threat. True. There was also a really good rat threat uh, that, that was yeah. really the, funny yep. and enjoyable. I don't remember the name of that mm-hmm. one offhand. But, um, the Hordes. Yeah. It was something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. That was fun, too. That, that was, was loads too. of fun, really. All, all three of them had great senses of humor, which I think is what really stood out. Calico Jenny's Curious Clouder was by Jim Crocker. Oh. I had a feeling. Did you really? <laughs> Mostly because at the end, a note about animal suffering. I just had a feeling. Oh. I was like, this feels like yeah, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, that's... He's always very careful. Yeah. I always appreciate that. But also like just the deep understanding of Katniss. Mm-hmm. I had a feeling it was Jim. <laughs> I just wasn't sure. But yeah, cool, cool, cool. Well, congratulations, Jim, for getting fourth place in the contest. Let's go to our third place entry. And this is the first one that will receive a cash prize, is the third place entry. 
Let's see, Lowell, what was the third place entry? So third place entry is Mean Times in Greenwich. Mean Times in Greenwich. This this one's so good. Ugh, I love this one. Yeah. Right. Really good. Yeah. yeah. It's about, there's a suicide. We don't know why this suicide has happened. This person had become erratic, and they were railing about certain things happening. And we end up tying that back to some material that had come, weird things that had come from a, a voyage with a HMS Persephone floating adrift with the <laughs> crew missing. And this item turns up and we start get this strange phenomena. It turns out that there's some time shenanigans going on. And of course, we've got that nice Mean Times in Greenwich. Good title. Great like, pun. That's, that's title, a good, yeah. that's smart Excellent. pun. Excellent. Essentially, the players have to figure out what this ship discovered, what was brought back. And the thread itself sets up like... Here are going to be some time slips. Here are going to be some ways to handle looking for the past, looking in the future, things like that, which is tough. That's a tough thing to put in here. But I think because of the nature of the between and the presentation of the thread itself, it gives the GM the tools they need to do this. This is one that you would have to read through a couple times as a GM, but the material is there. The ideas are there. The setup is there for that. I got the impression that it would work. Yeah. Time travel is hard in role-playing games, just like dreams. Dream scenarios are hard in role-playing games as well. But I got the impression that it should hang together based off the way the questions are structured. I mean, what would you think, Jenny? No, I agree. I feel like there's a lot of tools. I could tell that the writer really made sure that the keeper had different tools to draw from. So like you mentioned, the questions are really good. Also the idea of deja vu, right? They like listed that as a condition condition, that I thought, Mm -hmm. right? And it's such a good idea. I feel like with this mystery, you just need to have like a really mysterious (laughs) poker face. Like you feel like this has happened before. You can, right? So I feel like Mm -hmm. this threat really lends to that. It understands that. I think once again, it understands like the between is best done if you just like give these little like tantalizing yeah. mm-hmm. pieces and yeah. then let the players build from that. And I feel like there's just so much to work with here that I really think it would pull it off. I, I could tell how well crafted this is. Yeah. Yeah. Just something else I want to jump in and mention is it echoes some really interesting themes from the comic original source of From Hell mm. that Alan Moore wrote, Ooh. as well as the much later Leave Extraordinary Gentlemen that go into the 70s right. and 90s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a great source to go and look at to how you would connect these up. And I think that's what this thread is kind of hinting at is how you use the sequestrations of the characters and seeing other times, how you use those to maybe hint at or connect to larger themes, mm-hmm. maybe the masterminds themes and things like that. It, it has a lot of potential for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree completely. I also got vibes of only because I'm for another project. I'm like into this right now, or I, I by, by necessity, but there's an old British TV show called Sapphire and Steel. Oh, wow. It's, and it's, a, yeah. it's got vibes of that too. Don't you think? Yeah. So yeah. weird. Yeah. yeah. Sherry, what'd you think of Mean Times of Greenwich? When I read this, I could see it in my head as I was reading it. It was like, you know, in the second season of a show that had surprisingly good ratings and the network comes back and gives them a bigger budget, it feels like the second episode in that season where they go, okay, we got the money, let's do something big. <laughs> yeah. And it feels that way because it's got like all the costumes and they're switching the times and there's all the signatures of what's different and not, and there's a future version of the world. And, and yet, now the text is really excellent, but when you're reading it, it's very cinematic not cinematic it's very tv series mm-hmm. right. perfect mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in that prestige way TV prestige tv prestige tv with, with a beautiful scene set you <laughs> yeah. know and like and like the thematics tied in and the moments just like oh oh so perfect you know you're just like oh man you know the cinematographer was on it the the writers were all like into it and they had a strong sense to it it's a really good piece yeah, of yeah. writing Excellent. and of scene making. I love that it had three side characters who were the same character. Mm-hmm. The same yeah, person. I was about to say but, it's so heartbreaking and cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. Fantastic. Mean Times of Greenwich, a terrific, terrific entry. Really, really pushing on the outer boundaries of like what the between can do. And I think it will work. I feel pretty confident it will work. This one was by David Morrison, wrote... 
Mean Times in Greenwich. Oh, wow. Submitted two and both got a little nod. So congrats to David. Okay, before we go any further, a quick note. Um, we had some technical difficulties and we lost Jamie, but we are going to get their notes about the last entries and we will convey them to you listeners. We also have plenty to say about the top two as well. Yeah, congratulations, David. You are winner of one of the prizes. Let's go to second place and the second winner of one of the cash prizes sherry which was the second place entry it was the beetle the uh, beetle which, the beetle <laughs> the beetle we should say b-e-a-d-l-e that's important to the yes, joke mm-hmm. because this person worked as a beetle right they work for a deacon they help out with all the horrible horrible work that needs to be done but also they turn into a beetle <laughs> a B-E-E-T-L-E beetle. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> and that is pretty much the premise of figuring out why and how and what to do now right. is what the whole thing about is. And it is beautifully written. So beautifully written. Yeah, It is intimate and wistful and all of that in a very basement flat sort of way. There's a very domestic sense to it and a very sweet natured and sad Mm -hmm. sense to it it's terrific lol what'd you think about the beetle i really liked it it was one that as soon as i read it i was like okay this is very strange and i kind of love it for that there's a certain kafka-esque note to it there's a kind of cronenbergian Mm -hmm. material there it has great clues it has great moments and I'll mention this. This is something that, that Sherry and I talked about is that sometimes people don't realize how moments are supposed to be used. Mm-hmm. They create these flavors in the background. And this one starts to bring some of that to the table. And something that Jamie mentioned to me that I'll hit on is it's got a very different approach like the villain and the threat is maybe not a threat or maybe right. is you kind of have to decide about that so it makes for some really interesting player choices that maybe some of the more conventional like here's a horror that we're fighting threats don't do this one does and great characters the lascar sailor for example get the entomologist these are all dynamite bits this is the one Jamie stepped up and went, this is the Fought best one. For, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fought hard. We talked a lot about that because this is definitely Jamie's favorite. He says that this captures the between strengths and also provides interesting body and sensual horror. And it's a good one to have a different kind of threat in and amongst a sequence. Mm-hmm. And I think Jamie's right on all of those points. I absolutely love this one, and it was way, way, way at the top of the list for me, too. I'm going to take it a slightly different tack here. Sure. The author absolutely understands how the between works. They understand mechanically, almost at a design level, how the game functions. And it comes through in all of the really like unique and creative and even risky mechanical and procedural touches it throws into the mix i look at this stuff with a lot of scrutiny as the creator of the game and i know if something's going to work or it's not going to work and this stuff will all work it has a different aspect of the mask of the future which is super cool it gives you a permanent condition if you interact with this particular mask it's called the brooding chamber the author understands how custom moves work it has a really really gruesome custom move where you, upon taking the blood-soaked portal, which is dying in the game, instead of dying, you come back as a larva and you you enter a cocoon state and you incubate live young. And depending on how the roll goes, all these gruesome things happen with a larva. I mean, it's, it's so, so cool. It has a reward that is an unseen. So like the unseen part of the game is the part of the game where we sort of learn about London a little bit. It's a cutaway scene that you do during the night phase while you're doing your hunter scenes. So as a reward, you get this like look at London. It just, it just shows such a keen, insightful understanding of how the between works at the table. I actually, I know who the author is and I don't know if they've run or played the between much at all, but 
they've definitely studied it really closely because Mm -hmm. mechanically and procedurally, this one is super, super cool. In addition to being just really well written. Gorgeous. So who's the author? The author is Ben Bisogno. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Yes. Ben, uh, I was really excited to see you all pick it because Ben's very active in the publishing discord, very, very active and always really engaging with the creative side of the community. And so that's... It was super cool. Ben had another entry as well. There was an entry called The Nutcracker, Mm. which was one of my favorites in the contest. And that was also um, Ben's. Both just have this really beautiful, dripping, sensual quality to them, in addition to being just really mechanically clever. Just really love the Beatle. So, so good. So congratulations to Ben. First place. This is the winner of the contest overall, the winner of the bigger cash prize. So let's have it. Lowell, who won the Between Writing Contest? So our first place winner, after a, a lot of discussion going back and <laughs> forth, and it's so strong. Yeah. And this is the Drowned Guardian of the Docks. Drowned Guardian of the Docks. Awesome. And I'll give you the rundown on it. There was a tragedy in which a bunch of dock hands were killed in a, a collision. So we start out with this interesting backstory. There's a whole thing about corporate malfeasance and compensation and so on and then that's created a whole set of tensions on the docks but then we have some of these drowned workers miraculously appearing and they have this story of this guardian spirit then some vengeance being taken on people that might have been involved with the original crash and we know that it might be involved with a sea demon that's established early on But the question becomes, okay, how is this going on? What is the sacrifice? And what is happening here? This is a threat that every part of it is solid. Mm -hmm. It is cleanly written. Mm -hmm. It is clearly written. It is smart. It is evocative. Like every bit of it for me rang true. Hits all the marks. That setup, that tells us, okay, we're going to be running into some places, you know, with the dock hands, with that tension between the high and the low. It's going to be there and available to us. And I kind of like, we get it right out of the gate. Okay, there's a demon. Mm-hmm. This is where the strengths for the between start you out knowing. Like, it's a vampire. We know these it's facts. A it's a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it goes, okay, so what is that? Where do we go from there? Like, right. where, What does that tell us? Mm-hmm. And and how does that fit into the context of it? You know, here's a, a weird analogy, but there's that Friday the 13th TV series where they'd go and they'd find a weird object. Yes. Yeah. At the start, you'd see what it did. Right. And the best episodes, like when you actually got to it, you'd seen it was like a demon doll or whatever. Yeah. The twist of what it's actually doing yeah. is there. And this feels like that, like the best kind of smart horror stories of that. And inequality. Like having mm-hmm. inequality and class struggles in here is a number of the people did that in their it, threats. I think this theme. did it. Yeah. Yeah. This did it really well. Absolutely. Sherry, what'd you think of the drowned guardians of the docks? It did the things that I liked, like that were in black and white and red, which were, it was very Victorian. Mm-hmm. It was very human. The moments were perfect. The questions were perfect. The clues were like, ooh, every part of it, you went, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the thing that I love the most about it is that it was sweeping. Mm-hmm. It was a very, okay, there was a demon, but it was really a really human problem. Right, like a exactly. lot of human grief, yeah. mm-hmm. a lot of human anger, yep. a lot of frustration. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing is that those questions at the end, they give you that thing for the hunters of Hargrave House to really define what their version of justice is mm-hmm. in that moment. And that, I was like, Wow. There's a lot of freedom that comes with that. And I was like, okay, this is super good. And I just, when I would go back and I would reread it, I would go, man, everything is in place. It's got yeah. everything you need. It was just like a sort of perfection of form and some excellent innovation in there that just really made it stand out for me. Another thing is the side characters. We've got characters from a lot of different ethnicities and nationalities, which reflects the London of the time. And here's a little thing. With one exception, all of the side characters are written as gender neutral. Mm -hmm. Like we've got names, Mm -hmm. but they're written as they or them. 
you're allowed to have that room to kind of say, okay, what, what do you, who do you think this is? What fits with the theme? Do you want to play with the gender roles? Do you mm-hmm. want to, to keep them in line? And, I, and I, I love those little tweaks. You know, for me, what stood out for me about this one, I, I love this one. When I was reading it, I was really struck by how the author created a, it's almost like a setting within the setting. Mm-hmm. The dock worker set, it's almost like a, its own setting, right? Like it really truly felt like a, we're going to a new place, even though it's in London, it felt like a new place. And I think that's just a testament to how well written it is, right? Like everything just, it just hums with like detail and believability, which is yeah. hard to do in 2000 words, right? But this author did it for sure. The clues. hmm are so good in both giving us an interesting thing to think about in terms of what's going on in the mystery, but also evoking that world, Mm -hmm. evoking that very distinct place. They're great clues. These are some of the best, if not the best written set of clues amongst the threats. Yeah, I can definitely get behind that. We should read a couple of them. Overheard snatches of an old sea shanty, the same melody sung in different languages. That's pretty great scrapbook containing pages of prayers from different faiths again you get that cosmopolitan you know london aspect to it real simple ones abandoned craftsman's tools broken and bloody Mm -hmm. those simple clues like that are sometimes the best in the game because they just give you like so much to play with uh creatively floating candles Mm -hmm. set adrift under the stars later strange glowing lights pass beneath ships So so good so good yeah it's great I mean, we have to talk about the rewards. A couple of them are magic items, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is pretty great, yeah. right? I love all that. You get this really terrific special move that you can get called Time and Tide, in which the sea demon can help you find things that were lost or taken from you. I want to talk about the questions and opportunities. This is such an important part of the structure of a threat. And it's definitely the part where a number of the authors, a number of the contestants, rather, submitted really, really beautiful threats that worked in every way but the questions and opportunities, right? Like they just kind of uh-huh. fell down on the mm-hmm. questions and opportunities. And I always tried to note that in my little reviews. But this one is a great example of like how to do it because what it does is it presents three different options for resolving the threat. And that's not the only way to do it, but it's it's a great way of doing it. And each of them is progressively more difficult in complexity mm-hmm. in terms of answering the question but the opportunity is more dangerous. And that's that's how it should be balanced out. And these are so good. You can approach it by trying to figure out who made the pact with the demon and approaching it that way. Or you can just go directly to the demon and try to appease the demon. Or if you really want to go like for a, a wild result, you can make your own pact with the demon to resolve the threat. It presents these possibilities uh, that in the gameplay is really fun because you learn a lot about how the group wants to do things. Mm-hmm. And exactly. it's great fun. And I do think that it is like one of those ones that defines the group. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If it were a TV series, I'll keep going back to this because it feels very excellent TV this would be like a cornerstone set of episodes from that series for that season that you would talk about because it would tell you so much about Hargrave House and so much about a piece of London that they've made so colorful yeah. and so well-defined. Mm-hmm. You know, I had as a design goal a game that feels like prestige TV. <laughs> yeah, so, it, it works. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm just beside myself. This is so exciting. Anything else we want to say about The Drowned Guardian of the Docks? It's so good across the board. Yeah. yeah. The author of The Drowned Guardian of the Docks is Gabriel Robinson. Oh, he's so <laughs> he's good. He's so good. Yeah. Now, I'm going to mention here, Gabriel was the winner of the Trophy Gold Writing Contest and was a runner up oh, that's in right. the Trophy Dark Writing Contest. And listeners, I was not a judge this time. This was <laughs> Sherry and Lowell and Jamie who picked Gabriel as the winner. So you can't say anything to me. It was judge blind and Gabriel's just real good. So, you know, you can't, wow, can't take it I, away. Wow, that's amazing to me. Yeah. Boy, this is Gabriel's. He's good. <laughs> wow. I've backed a couple of his uh, zine Token things that he's done. Yeah, that's yeah, so good. Yeah. Yeah, Gabriel's like, he's very active in the in the trophy creation community, especially. And I was really excited when he got interested in doing stuff in between because he's a fantastic writer and he he knows the game. He's really done his homework. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you all so much. I mean, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for judging this contest. It was such a oh, yeah. tremendous amount of work, <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed it. And I know I certainly enjoyed reading them. And for people who are listening, especially if you're one of the contestants, if you're listening, congratulate yourself. Like whether you 
won something or whether you got a spotlight or whatever, or, or, or even if you just submitted something, that's a victory. Just participating in submitting something. The quality level was so, so high. Yeah. Yep. The entries that we featured today were like the best of an extremely good bunch, right? So um, like everyone should feel super, super proud of what they did. I'm just so delighted. Congratulations again to our folks who placed I think that's kind of all we got. Let's talk about where you can find us. This podcast is a production of The Gauntlet, of course. You can find The Gauntlet on Twitter at gauntletrpg. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com. You can support The Gauntlet financially at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Judges, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Rich, editor, thank you so much. And listeners, thank you. Take care. Listeners, we want to let you know that Hearts of Wulin, our PBTA game of wuxia melodrama, is now available as a PDF on Drive-Thru RPG. Hearts of Wulin emulates films like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Shadow, and TV series like The Untamed and Ancient Detective. It is inspired by the Chinese martial arts novels of Jin Yong and Gu Long and their many adaptations. In these tales, romance is as dangerous as a blade. You can buy Hearts of Wulin at the Gauntlet store on DriveThruRPG. You can find more information and resources for it on our Gauntlet blog, on the Gauntlet webpage at gauntlet-rpg.com.